pleased that we're going to have a presentation this evening from Pete Slavinsky, who's the chair of the Conservation Commission. Uh, he's a marine uh, geologist, biologist, geologist with the main geological survey, and we're going to talk about the effects of storms and sea level rise and potential down the road um, with the town, just to start this discussion. Um, and I'll let Peter go on with that. Very quickly, I just wanted to thank the members of the Conservation Commission for showing up. And if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself yeah, real I'm quickly. I'm Ivan Carlson, I'm the Vice Chair. I'm Chuck Spanger, I'm the newest member. Uh, I'm Pete Polinski, the Chair. Susan Nixon, member. Anson Voter, I'm the Secretary. <laughs> So, uh, thank you. Thank yeah, you. these are the folks who uh, do this work. So, with no further ado, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thanks for making the time tonight to, to hear us out. Um, there's a memo in your packets, a uh, one-pager um, that we submitted to the council, which kind of summarizes the ideas that we have uh, moving forward. And I'd like to just give this short 12, 15-minute presentation, Max, to give you some background information on why we think it's important for the town to move forward with developing a departmental engagement process to develop resiliency. Um, so being a scientist, I'll throw a couple things at you that relate to sea level rise and storms, but we'll keep them simple, and um, then move to some of the studies that have actually been done in town, because we've had a lot of different studies that have been done in town. Um, as we know, coastal flooding is actually increasing in the due of precipitation and tides, whether it's tides or sea level rise that are driving it. This, these are images from last September, end of September in Portland and Brunswick. Mm -hmm. um, there was about five inches of rain that fell in a six mm -hmm. hour period and combined with a high tide and a little bit of surge. So all it takes is for some, for some of these facilities is for just a little bit of perfect conditions to melt together for things to happen. So we're seeing increases in precipitation. Um, we're seeing increases in sea level. This is just a, a graph of yearly sea levels going back from 1912 to 2015. The overall trend is rising. Um, sea levels are rising at a rate of about seven inches per century. That's about what the global oceans are doing. Uh, and more significantly, over the last 20 years, um, there, have, there has been about a doubling of that rate, up to about 13 inches uh, per century. And uh, you can see um, you know, the top here is the 2010 outlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2010, um, we actually had an abrupt sea level change. It changed about five, six inches for months at a time. And it was due to a uh, slowdown in the Gulf Stream and then some weather patterns and the way they set up in terms of high pressure and low pressure uh, off of Greenland and the Azores. And that, when that happens, we can have abrupt changes of about six inches. It doesn't sound like much. So, but what are the impacts? You take normal coastal storms and then put them on that and you get historic erosion. This is Higgins Beach in 2010, in April. Everyone I've spoken with down at the beach that's lived there for 40, 50 years has said they've never seen this amount of marsh show up. This is an old marsh that's drowned. It's where the beach is now. Mm. So what used to be marsh is now beach, and it only becomes eroded during these historic events. So those minimal changes in sea level rise can exacerbate beach erosion. Sea level is expected to continue to rise. There are a variety of different climate models and stuff that's out there to tell us where, where it might go in the future in terms of scenarios. This is from the U.S. National Climate Assessment. The key here is that it can range somewhere from the historic trend to somewhere of up around six feet. Okay? Based on where we are now in terms of the latest trends of a, a long-term trend of this and a short-term trend of that, we're trending right now between the intermediate low and intermediate high scenarios. Okay? So when we, if we uh, adopted an intermediate high scenario, for instance, for planning, we'd be looking at about one foot by 2050, two feet by somewhere around 2070, and somewhere between three and four feet by around 2100. Also, combining with that is, you know, we've had some history of some larger tropical events actually making their way somewhat closer to New England. Uh, this is Sandy making landfall. Uh, and as we know, as a result of a lot of this, and the town's currently waiting for new maps to come out, but our FEMA flood insurance rate maps they are changing. This is a snapshot from the town GIS website of the old flood maps. You see a zone of 10 feet. It means during a storm you can expect a 10-foot water level, 10-foot water level. And those are changing significantly. Uh, this is 13 feet, 14 feet, you know, 14 feet, 15 feet. So these changes are based on historic. They're not looking forward in time. Okay? 
So we know things are changing. So what has the town actually done? I'm not going to read these, but we've been involved in a lot of different efforts. The first is the Sea Level Adaptation Working Group, which includes the communities of Scarborough, Saco, Old Orchard, and Bedford. It's been in place for six years now, basically. And the towns have been working on sea level rise and resiliency. And a lot of the efforts and pictures that I'm going to show in the next couple slides come from those efforts. So what is actually potentially at risk when we're, when we're thinking about this? Buildings, primary and secondary buildings. And this is just from high tide, the highest tide of the year back in, I think, 2011. Beautiful day, no surge, and the, you know, the parking lot of the Clam Bay floods when, 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 the, when the tide gets this high. Um, so the SLOG group did an analysis, and this is really busy, but I'll just focus in on this block here, of what, of the, what building footprints are currently located in the mapped 100-year floodplain. Okay, and this is primary and secondary structures. And then what building footprints are actually located in what we call a coastal erosion hazard area. And that's only in sand dune systems like Higgins Beach, Pine Point, things like that, Scarborough Beach. So we'll focus in on this little area here. This just gives you an idea of what's at existing risk, not future risk, but this is existing potential risk due to erosion and flooding. So building footprints in red mean the building footprints are located in the erosion hazard area and in the tidal floodplain, and orange is in the tidal floodplain only. This is just a snapshot from the community. Uh, this is some of the work that SLOG did in 2011. Uh, they also did simulations of sea level rise, of building impacts that might, of building footprints that might be impacted. So this is a scenario where you've got the gr all the building footprints in town as of 2006. This is the data we have at the time. Um, if it's impacted, it's red, and this is a two-foot scenario. So this is the back point of Pine Point, and all of Pine Point goes underwater here in Pine Point Road. So. Summarizing all that, we tried to quantify this stuff in terms of numbers as well. Um, so there's about $21 million of taxable building value that's at risk in the erosion hazard area and about $124 million at risk in the existing map floodplain. When you look at sea level rise, so this is just a static rise in sea level, no storms or anything on top of it. We're talking about 600 structures roughly or $34 million of potential uh, risk. So what's at risk in terms of public and private roads? Um, this is Route 1 during a high tide. We know it's mm. just on the edge of flood. So we did a similar analysis, uh, but looked at a range of different sea level rise scenarios or storm surge scenarios, and these are the different colored roads as they're inundated under these different conditions. Nothing's really inundated under existing highest tide, but once you add one foot of sea level rise, there are some pretty significant uh, impacts. So this is focusing in on Route 1. You can see here, just with one foot, there's the majority of Route 1 that goes underwater. Um, there's another stretch that goes underwater. And the problem is, is that then also a section of Payne Road, which is your way around, mm -hmm. also goes underwater. So there are some, some significant emergency management implications potentially for this. We also quantified all this in these wonderful, colorful matrix tables. All these numbers are is length of road that's potentially inundated under these scenarios, and then they're color-coded as to no impact, some impact, moderate impact, major, or severe, okay? And we looked at a range of different scenarios. All of this is available on our website to look at if you want to dig in further. So this was handed to Public Works, and they have this, so they know this stuff. So just to summarize, um, there's a lot of roads that are at risk. With one foot of sea level rise, there's approximately 2.2 miles of road that could be inundated at the highest tides. <coughs> So what about our natural resources? The marsh system is the largest in the entire state of Maine and the Scarborough Marsh system, <coughs> and it's comprised mostly of what we call high marsh, which exists from about mean high water to the high tide, and it's this large, taller, or shorter green grass that looks like hair, and then the low marsh, which pretty much exists along tidal channels. This is a simulation of what the existing marsh system lo looks like. It's about 70% high marsh, 30% low marsh. Um, this is just, the, you know, this is the Scarborough River right here, Higgins Beach right here. So just keep an eye on these colors as they change. Scenario of one foot. So we're converting from high marsh to low marsh. Two feet. Three feet. And six feet. So what we're seeing is potential conversion to open water as well. The other thing Slaw looked at is how these marshes would change. These are acreage of the marshes under existing conditions, so it's majority high marsh. Then it's low marsh, low marsh dominated, but it's expanding. 
low marsh dominated, really, really dominated the expanding, and then conversion to high marsh, to open water. So we have a natural resource here that we also need to manage potentially in the face of sea level rise. Um, the state has also created data viewers. Um, you can go to these websites or just Google sea level rise, Maine Geological Survey. You can fly around the whole state looking at this stuff. Uh, zoom all the way in, zoom all the way out. Disclaimers are all over it. Shouldn't be used for specific stuff, but people can access it. We've done the same thing for hurricanes, landfalling from one to four, category mm -hmm. one through four hurricanes. So all this data is now available for us to use to kind of engage departments. So what do we actually propose to do? There's a lot of data. We want to take all this data and work with our planning department liaison to engage some specific departments in town to figure out what is their knowledge on this stuff? What have they been doing? What are some problems they've been having in terms of coastal storms? What is Public Works constantly cleaning up? What are they thinking about? Um, what are some issues that they have? And work cooperatively with them to develop specific recommendations on for how each department could move forward in the face of coastal storms under existing conditions and potential sea level rise. And we were thinking about working with these um, four different departments. Uh, and if there's others that we missed, we're certainly happy to consider um, working with them also. But it would be kind of a cooperative process uh, of this. It wouldn't be just uh, in silos. Um, we think it would take about a year to sit down with each each department and get all of their input on, on these issues and what they're thinking about the future and things like that. And our goal really is to come back to you folks with some specific recommendations, not that we come up with, but with that the departments would come up with in terms of moving forward on these issues. Um, and uh, that, um, there's uh, some links on our website where you can actually download some of these reports if you want to. I know you folks are busy, so maybe you probably don't want to be downloading <laughs> stuff, but um, that's what we had for a presentation. And um, I don't know if Jay wanted to add anything in terms of uh, the, the planning department, you know, what, what, what you folks have been doing or, or go right to questions or what. So thank you for your time. Thank you. I didn't have anything in particular to add other than to say that, you know, um, clearly we're pretty lucky here in Scarborough to have Pete as a resource when yeah. it comes to these issues. <laughs> uh, you know, I go to a lot of conferences, trainings, and workshops, and I see Pete there. He's always at the front of the room while I'm <laughs> sitting. So um, I've certainly learned a great deal from him, as I know of our other commissioners. So, um, and yeah, I'm really here just to support the commission in their efforts and take the guidance of the council at this time. Thank you. Councilors, uh, questions uh, or comments? Do you see this um, working alongside and being part of the comprehensive plan process as well? It certainly could be. Um, some communities have actually taken this kind of work and uh, developed specific chapters in right. the comprehensive plan yeah. that relate to how should the town in the short term or long term respond to sea level rise from a natural environment to the built environment. Um, that could happen. I think that would probably be a decision with uh, the planning department and you folks. Um, so it's been done. York has done it. Bodenham has done it. Kenneth Bunk is working on that right now. Um, and certainly it could be something that the Long Range Planning Committee could, could be considering also. So it has been done and could be. Other, other comments or questions? Okay. I just wanted to thank you and the, for putting this together. Sure. I mean, I. I was aware of some of the issues because I have to drive <laughs> through them sometimes because um, I'm on that side of town. Yep. But I had no idea the extent of what was happening, especially in our beach areas, <coughs> um, and uh, potential and the potential of what could happen to some of those homes down there um, is a really scary thought. So I very much appreciate your presentation, and I know that there's a lot of people out there that will watch this and also um, probably start paying a little bit more attention to it, which I think is really important. Thank you. Very well. Good. So this strikes me that it isn't just a Scarborough issue, it's a community issue or a regional issue, obviously, with SLAW and things like that. Are there other initiatives in the greater Portland area that are uh, mitigation issues or whether it's, you know, emergency response issues yep. or general plans? Yes, is okay. the short, short response. Um, uh, through this collaborative process of working with communities, including Scarborough, um, our department has actually worked with 38 different communities along the coast. Uh, mostly in York and Cumberland counties, some in Lincoln County. And things have ranged from communities deciding to do something with a comprehensive plan to simply education and outreach, where there's neighborhood association presentations, which we've already kind of tackled. We've done some down in Higgins Beach. We haven't done Pine Point yet. Um, to 
some communities have decided to do something with their floodplain management ordinances, saying, you know what, our minimum standards aren't enough. We want to go. We want to go a little higher. Um, others have developed climate action plans in terms of not just what they might want to do in terms of sea level rise and storms, but they broaden the scope to include what do we want to do in the face of climate change. That's a lot hairier of a subject, I would say, to, to tackle. Um, Portland has done some significant things in terms of uh, looking at waterfront infrastructure, um, doing economic analyses of what is potentially at risk, some very detailed economic analyses. Mm -hmm. um, Cape Elizabeth has undertaken some steps. South Portland has undergone a similar process. Um, so you guys aren't alone <coughs> thinking about this, and there are a lot of communities that have, you know, at least taken the steps of doing the vulnerability assessments. Mm -hmm. The hard part is then translating great so we know we're vulnerable to actionable items. And that's what we're hoping to, to help the process with here. So Bill, if I could, sorry, just to yeah, follow up. Right um, would that be something the Conservation Commission would be able to produce for the council? Would be a list of other activities that are potential outcomes that we could do? Or is that something of now that we're aware, you know, looking at what's been done in the region, what might yeah. be easily adoptable versus might be more of a, a stronger effort? I, I certainly think with planning department's input, um, we could come up with a list of potential things that from a policy and also from a recommendation standpoint that might be applicable to the town or what, what's been done elsewhere that would be applicable. See that being a problem. So my question was just in terms of <coughs> what are the next steps for, for us in terms of it sounds like you're you're here presenting the information but also asking about, you know, kind of what the next steps are to talk to those those uh, uh, various departments in town. I mean what, what is it what are the what's the action that we need to take? make that happen, it sounds like. Yeah, it, it's, it. Uh, I expect that the council is going to endorse rather strongly the systematic approach that, you, that the Conservation Commission has laid out here tonight. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, a very serious connection with each of the groups that has a significant stake in this uh, seems to me to be combined with the, with the comprehensive plan uh, update that's being uh, proposed and will be initiated by the planning department mm -hmm. within the next six months, uh, it will start to get off the ground. So uh, these these two aspects seem to dovetail pretty nicely together. So then that's the action is to, to some kind of endorsement from us to say right. this is. And, and I think we're looking for uh, uh, that that kind of uh, judgment on our part. Are we are are we in favor of? Yeah giving to the, uh, the Conservation Commission the responsibility to get this started <coughs> and really grab it and, and then come back. And we have the benefit of a liaison uh, representative who can, I think, uh, and we'll take those updates much more seriously. We'll be listening attentively because the, uh, the data is so sobering that <coughs> you can't help but uh, uh, take it into account. And it takes a tremendously long lead time to be able to actually make these sorts of adjustments. Right. Right. So there, there may be one actual item that the council could consider. Uh, a past council has tabled the matter pending the, um, the, uh, the new FEMA flood maps. And that is some code <coughs> issues around building elevation, <coughs> how high you build. Uh, that matter was, uh, was tabled just until we had a better sense of what the impacts are with the new maps. We're told those maps will be released sometime this summer. Is that over <laughs> here <laughs> yeah, it was my understanding from the floodplain management office, who's also in our department, was they were supposed to actually be out now, but they were delayed again. So that's yeah. like the third best yeah, award right. delay. I mean, it's just, we've been talking about this for two years. Right. Yeah, the initial maps came out in 2009. Yeah. Yeah. Since 2009 was when they came out with the original. So I, I just alert you that might be something very tangible, very actionable that the council may consider uh, again, coincident with the issuance of the new maps that might happen sooner than later. Certainly the long-range planning aspect of this would seem to say, let's not wait for That's FEMA true. to yeah. issue the map. Right. If there is uh, energy and enthusiasm to provide leadership for the community and the Conservation Commission, right. then I think the town council would endorse that, that kind of initiative. I, I'm right. also thinking short-term. I mean, we've had Mike come in front of us with stormwater management on, on the East Grand Ave. That's something that I would think tie into this issue quite extensively. If it's a major infrastructure rebuild, we need to be looking 15, 20, 25 years right. out before we authorize some kind of project so that we're not, you know, initiating something that's going to have a five-year lifespan. 
today. So, uh, you know, it might be a, that might be the onus as well to kind of push the process along. Jean Marie. Uh, I mean, I agree. That I I would not want to wait for the flood maps. These flood maps, it's political right now. It's political football, so God only knows when they may or may not come out. Uh, I would just assume, you know, this commission, I've, I've served with them before I became elected to the council and then became the liaison, and we've been talking about this for a while, um, and I do think, you know, now we've got all this information, why not start moving forward with a process? And what we're asking for basically is the permission to start sitting down along with planning uh, department, with the various departments, and just get the process mm -hmm. started about thinking about what's in the future, what's coming, possibly coming down the line to plan. So. Other comments? I was just going to say, is there something to get on the agenda? If it's on the action for this council, can we get on the agenda soon? Next, next meeting? Yeah. Yeah, the next yeah. June first, uh, and suddenly, uh, I, I think we would all look to the planning department yeah. to give us guidance on uh, on this process, so that it would be very much uh, a collaborative process between the conservation commission and our planning department. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, does it? I guess my question is, does it need a formal um, action? I mean, I think I didn't hear anybody here in disagreement of what they presented. I would think that, I guess I'm kind of asking you more, I mean, does it need to be an agenda item? I mean, I would think that we could just give them permission to hit this head on. Like Jean Marie said, they've been, they've been talking about this forever. And we've got a council or a liaison who's backing all of that up. Is that an, isn't that enough or do you think we need to have an agenda item with more discussion. Tom, what do you I would I would suggest just having lived through uh, introducing it the last time, um, for instance, requiring that we build three feet above flood stage as opposed to one has financial implications. And so I would strongly recommend that I, I appreciate the sentiment uh, and wanting to do something, but I think there ought to be some process that people are aware of it. Um, I know Jan and Jay had done some financial analysis as to what the financial impact of building two more feet higher. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's some sensitivity around those issues, and so I don't want to have you headlong run into this and, and run into a stone wall, frankly. Um, I think we can dust it off and bring it back to you. Uh, and, and I think giving formal guidance to the process would be just putting our imprimatur on and the action would probably be appropriate, and I think the Conservation Commission and the Planning Department would appreciate right. having that. Yeah. So why don't we assume that responsibility, uh, and Tom and the Planning Department can work together to advance that and then bring it back to us. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thank you. 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 Thank you.